Hi, I'm Tony. I'm Patrick. <laughs> We'd like to welcome you to another episode of Cave to the Cross Apologetics. And we'll be examining a really good book this time by uh, Nancy Piercy. And it's called Finding Truth. And the kind of the subheading here is five principles. So five principles for unmasking atheism, secularism, and other God substitutes. So that's where... Uh, we want to spend our time looking at Nancy Piercy's book. So what does this book do? Well, this book, as her as the foreword, by the way, the foreword was written by her husband, J. Richard Piercy. I'm sure she had to pay a lot of, yeah. a lot of money for that <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah, right. Big endorsement. Yeah. He says that uh, Finding Truth articulates a set of key strategic principles by which to evaluate the authenticity of any worldview that we encounter, right? So whether it's in the classroom or the office or, you know, on the news or on the street or whatever. Yeah. So that's, that's, uh, that, that would be really helpful. Yeah. And so, uh, and he also says that um, Finding Truth argues that no secular worldview adequately accounts for the phenomena of man and the cosmos and what we know of human nature and physical uh, nature. In other words, no secular worldview accounts for uh, the world reality as we know it. Right. right? Yeah, we, we, we saw that with uh, Mitch Stokes's book, uh, How to Be an Atheist, uh, in our last uh, last book that we uh, took on. And so uh, this is kind of a uh, less uh, esoteric uh, philosophy, but there's, I mean, there's still some philosophy in here. Yeah. And it's more of a, uh, a, a how-to guide a little bit. Exactly. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's breaking down, or how, how, to, how to break down uh, uh, worldviews and uh, kind of take that first initial step so that way you can evaluate what evidence is being presented to you. Yeah, so this is a book about strategy in terms mm -hmm. of looking at worldview. What is the strategy uh, as we examine worldviews and then and then from there, you know, as we break those down, uh, how can we understand them and where do they go wrong and that sort of thing. She says that, uh, you know, learning how to respond thoughtfully to every competing worldview would take a lifetime of study, right? Right? Uh, and what happens when we encounter a new one that we haven't yeah. uh, studied before? Now we have to go back and study it, right? Lots of Twitter posts. Yeah, so way. do we have to come up, she's asked, with a new argument every time? And she's going to say no, that there is an overarching strategy that we can use when we're examining these things. And her question is, is it possible to find a single line of inquiry that we can apply universally to all ideas? Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's what she wants to give us. She says, what I've discovered is that the Bible itself offers a powerful strategy for critical thinking. And she calls these five principles that cut to the heart of any worldview. So how about that? Yeah, right? not too bad. So, you know, the book that uh, we would expect to do that does that for us, the, the <laughs> scriptures, the Bible, right? right? She says that by mastering these uh, principles, you'll be equipped to answer any challenge while making a compelling and attractive case uh, for Christianity. Mm -hmm. right? And some of the other books that, that she's written, too, uh, uh, takes these principles, but th this is the one that kind of formulates it. Uh, her most recent one, Love Thy Body, really mm -hmm. really does a good job yeah. of, of utilizing these as well and saying, let's take a look at what's going on in our world today in 2020 now, yeah. from yeah. the future or from the past, depending on when you're uh, uh, viewing this. And uh, it's it applies uh, uh, kind of how people speak about uh, people, uh, the human condition, where the universe came from, uh, why is there something rather than nothing? It, kind of those three questions that, again, going back to Mitch Stokes' book, yeah. uh, philosophers or scientists are, are scientists are now trying to answer those questions because uh, all the uh, theology people and philosophers have been kind of kicked to the curb, and science now reigns supreme. Yeah, yeah, good. So she also, by the way, has a previous book, actually several previous books, mm -hmm. but one that's kind of on this line, it's called uh, Total Truth. Yeah. And there she deals with some some of these kind of issues and worldview issues there. This one, as you mentioned, is more specific in terms of uh, laying out principles and strategies to, to deal with these various worldviews. Right. And so if uh, you're not new to presuppositionalism, of, of course, the place that we kind of get the, our, our looking at worldviews comes from the book of Romans. And again, Paul is writing to uh, the Roman church, a place he hasn't gone to, a place that he's been wanting to go to for, from his initial one. He's a Roman by birth. Um, there's there's a lot of his background that uh, is Roman-esque. And um, here he is writing kind of, uh, she, she calls it, um, presents the Christian message in a comprehensive way uh, in, in a, a really well laid out 
philosophical, detailed. I mean, you can really tell uh, the 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 person who wrote Romans really had a good philosophical understanding of kind of the the, the way that we do. Um, uh, arguments, uh, yeah, arguments and all and, kinds and, of things. Right, yeah, yeah. it's very, yeah. very Greek based. Yeah. And, uh, it's it's very well laid out, and I mean, talk about comprehensive. Uh, it only changes kind of direction in twelve, where he goes, and therefore, yeah. one through uh, chapter one through twelve, <laughs> and then a therefore yeah. right in the in, middle. In fact, of it. really, it follows <laughs> Paul's pattern in in many of his other uh, right. writings. Right, he gives kind of the doctrine, the theology, mm-hmm. and then he kind of applies it, right? yeah. the duty, what we should right. do. And, yeah, and Ephesians that has that same yeah. middle break and, yeah. and everything like that, too. Um, so uh, Romans 1 is setting up uh, kind of a universality of worldview, and then he um, breaks down like chapter 2, talking to just the Jews and um, um, bringing in uh, Gentile believers, or j- just Gentile people in general, and so on and so forth. Uh, but here uh, we, we, um, we have uh, Nancy Piercy giving us... Uh, that uh, Romans 1 is uh, Paul's apologetics training manual. Mm. So where does Paul begin his training manual? His first major point is that all people, that means everywhere and at all times, have access to evidence for God's existence. Mm. But how? Mm. You know, uh, if we've been on the Internet uh, as Christians more than 12 seconds, we've encountered people that said, well, pr- provide me the evidence. Show me yeah. the peace of God in my hand. Don't don't <laughs> give me argumentation. Show me the evidence. I want only the evidence. Uh, Bertram Russell, the 20th century philosopher, famously <laughs> said, you know, if he was to die and stand before God and God said, why didn't you believe? <laughs> evidence. Not enough evidence. Not enough right? evidence. Yeah. Shaking your finger. Yep. <laughs> good. Good. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, oh, hope, really. Hope it works out for you. <laughs> So, uh, what is uh, what is this evidence? Uh, how are we given this evidence? Well, it's through the creative order, and there are two avenues of of this, and both of them are revelatory in, in the sense that they tell us something. So, one is through the general revelation, and that's uh, accessible to anybody. So, again, general, like uh, a deterrence. If you've studied criminality, there's general and specific deterrence. General is uh, kind of the, the, the punishment is carried out before people so that it tells people not to do this or you'll face similar consequences. And then specific is to, to a single person alone. So you put somebody in jail, you stop them from deterring right. or from, right. from right. causing a crime. So the general evidence then, would, or the general revelation is... Uh is the created order, right? right? Everything yeah. that we see and everything that we're exposed to, and that sort of thing. Yeah, right? pretty much everything. <clears throat> everything yeah. uh, uh, belongs under God's worldview, and so anytime you point to anything, that's evidence for God. Yeah. Uh, but then, uh, special revelation is kind of what we call uh, salvation. So yeah. God's well, scriptures, yeah. right? They're they're the special. Now God, so God reveals generally throughout the whole world. The scriptures then are a special revelation, mm-hmm. right? Right. Yeah. So it, it's him speaking specifically to a people in time, um, and he's kind of uh, clarifying, uh, um, uh, drawing out principles uh, from from uh, his uh, his will. Mm. So uh, we start with, uh, we all have access to evidence for God through creation. And this is uh, Romans 19 through 20. What can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. This means all people. Uh, Verse 20, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So that's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. And all of this is is, its evidence. It's clearly clearly, uh, perceived, right, by... um, since the creation of the world, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so, yeah, everybody has access to this evidence, right. external evidence that God provides in creation. So both the physical nature and human nature give evidence to our creator. So, uh, yes, because we're part of creation as well, right? Yeah, sadly, we are creatures <laughs> just, just as much as, uh, as the frog or the rock. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, the universe cannot be explained as a product of nature alone uh, because uh, the origin of the universe and the origin of life, uh, it doesn't allow for, um, you know, the non-living material to create living material, although um, that's obviously contested within the evolutionary f- framework. Um, but uh, again, I'd point back to uh, Mitch Stokes' How to Be an Atheist, uh, that book that we did uh, for kind of further explanation on on kind of the the claims here. Yeah, and the point she's trying to make, I think, here is that, you know, um, the universe can't explain itself. Right. Right? In other words, it's uh, it's not, it can't be a pro- product, she says, of natural causes alone. Mm-hmm. There has to be something outside of it that 
that's caused it. Right. Uh, that's what she's getting yeah. at here. So we have things like the fine tuning uh, problem, which is, you know, everything seems really well set up for life in the universe, in our world, um, you know, closest to the sun, uh, the, the type of life that has been produced, uh, you know, just um, just how, how life seems to uh, carry on and how there are uh, different defenses techniques. There's different um, ways that um, uh, people and animals habitate and yeah. and continue the, the species. Um, so th there just seems to be a lot working in our favor to keep us alive. Yeah. Well, yeah, and so the basic idea of the fine-tuning argument really is that it seems as if Earth, you know, has been fine-tuned for life, to, prov to, to have life on it, right? And so all the various forces, the four major forces, you know, and that sort of thing, uh, all have to be in exactly a particular uh, little spectrum in order for, you know, life to exist, right? And, and the various chemical reactions, all that kind of stuff, uh, gravity, that kind of stuff has to be exactly the way it is. We have to have a certain distance from the sun in order for, you know, water to exist on the earth and that sort of thing. And so there's, it, there's these various things that seem to indicate that the earth is fine-tuned in order for life to exist, mm -hmm. right? She so goes, this is kind of a, this is kind of like a, um, you know, one of those uh, arguments, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, teleological argument. Right. It's a, it's a poor. It's a uh, so the teleological argument argues that based on you know the, uh, the how things are organized, that there is an intelligence behind it. Mm -hmm. right? That's the idea here. Right. So she goes on to say the the, the puzzling thing to the problem of the fine tuning. Uh, problem is that there's no physical cause to explain it. There's not. There's not a machine in the sky that we can look to that is rearranging you know the, the moon a certain distance away it seems like uh you know uh, a belief in the big bang a giant explosion happens and then you have from there uh, a sequential event where uh you know uh, uh, um, uh, elements form uh stars form planets form life forms all these things just seem to uh, happen in kind of perfect quantities and perfect qualities and and um we're here as as a result of so many different uh, oopsies along the way, and uh, or seemingly oopsies, yeah, right? Right, right. Uh, very, very uh, scientific in, in there. That's yeah, the oopsie that's problem. Right. That's yeah. A, yeah, yeah, the, the so, oopsie issue. Yeah. Uh, so she quotes here is a physicist Dave, uh, Paul Davies says it's almost as if a grand designer has figured it all out, yeah. but we know that's not the case. So we'll continue on. Uh, there's also uh, evidence from life, the origin of life itself. Uh, the central role of information explains why scientists have failed to cook up life in the chemistry lab, whereas uh, uh, chemistry is about substances and how they react, whereas biology appears to have uh, concepts such as information, which is clearly not chemical, which I think is a very interesting point. Yeah, Genetic yeah. information can only be described using terminology borrowed from mental world of from the mental world of language and communication. When we talk about DNA and um, uh, uh, um, Dr. Um, Dr. Jason Lyle uh, talks about this in. Uh, Best or ultimate proof for creation. Yeah. Um, he talks about the the role of information in DNA. DNA uh, seems to be the only uh, source of information that scientists will point to that said that there's no uh, communicator behind it. There's no there's no intelligence behind it that is communicating a message, which is what DNA yeah. uh, by definition is. Yeah. So so her point again is she's trying to she's trying to argue that there is indeed evidence. Mm -hmm. right? There's evidence for God. There's evidence from the physical uh, world, right? All all of the uh, you know the, the fine tuning issue and that sort of thing. There's evidence uh, from life, right? So notice something didn't come from from. It had to come from something else, right? The physical world had to come from something else. Life, uh, you know, didn't come from non-life. Mm -hmm. It had to come from something else, right? We have, you know, otherwise we would have something coming from nothing, life coming from non-life, right? And repeatedly, Yeah, probably. information uh, from chaos, which we would say that can't happen. So mm -hmm. it has to have a source as well. Right. So those are right. the points he's trying to make here with regard to evidence. And if you're already coming up with, well, what about or, well, that's just your explanation. 
there's a point to it. So, <laughs> so continue on with yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, we we might want to say that uh, you know these various arguments. You know, you can you can be um, on either side of these, even as a believer, right? Right. There are many believers that that suggest, well, these arguments really aren't persuasive mm-hmm. and we would say yeah that's that's that could be true right i mean there there are various ways to look at these things but it, the, the problem is it's is how you view the world it's your worldview right it's uh something becomes evidence based on um uh your theory or your worldview right? yeah so a particular fact let's say this is a fossil right this is a fossil so this pencil is a fossil uh, it's a fossil of i don't know some uh limb of some ancient creature, right? Um, well, it, it could be evidence of the age of the earth is millions and millions of years old, right? Because we believe that fossils or this particular creature and that sort of thing is, uh, you know, it's from, from millions of years ago or thousands even, that mm-hmm. sort of thing, right? Or it could be evidence of a uh, of uh, what was left over by a cataclysmic flood, that happened several thousand years ago, right? So notice, facts need some type of context. Now, what happens is, is you have to evaluate the context, the worldview, in order to determine, you know, how the fact, uh, the evidence is being, uh, uh, the fact is looked at in terms of evidence. Right. So the what? So the the, the issue here is the um, what evidence is is a, a fact becomes evidence when it makes a particular theory or position or worldview more probable. Mm-hmm. That's what we mean by evidence, right? So it's more than so so facts are out there and everybody sees the facts. Everybody has the same facts, right? But what makes one fact evidence for one position and one fact evidence for and and that same fact evidence for another position is the probability that that fact gives us that the particular position is true. And so if a particular fact aids to your position and, and, and adds to the probability that it's true, then it becomes evidence for your position. Right. That's the basic idea. That's why when, when people even argue for, well, it's just a brute fact. It's just, it's just there. We all right. recognize it. Right. E- even the ability to see it, to recognize it, to evaluate it, uh, uh, to uh, test it, um, are, are all uh, kind of determined within the confines of your worldview. Mm-hmm. So if you're Neo and you're in the Matrix and you're convinced because you've seen the real world, uh, the pencil is just a product of code and yeah. it's it's evidence for the Matrix. So <laughs> so it, it uh, you're, you're both wrong. The, yeah. the, the Christian and the atheist are both wrong, at least in that confines. Yeah. Yeah. Um, getting back to uh, evidence for life, uh, the um, intelligent agent that uh, there, there seems to be uh, evidence within the confines of life that an intelligent agent agent was necessary at the origin of life because uh, we don't see non living things produce living things. Uh, there are there are theories again there are theories uh, that that claim to have evidence that um, show these things. But uh, if you extrapolate it to other areas and say, uh, well the the murder weapon the the gun uh, was found on the crime scene that just happened to appear there. Uh, the universe seemed to conjure up uh, a, a weapon that was designed to, to murder the person, and so <laughs> there's really no murderer. Well, we'd say, well, n- no, that's clearly not the case, because we've seen murders happen a 100,000 times before, and it's like, well, yes, but we've also seen th- things produce, uh, you know, living things produce living things a 100 million times before, too. So, it, so, it's so, so you know, we want to know, is it consistent with our experience of the world? Right. Empirical adequacy, I think mm-hmm. that's what we call that. Uh, so uh, a mind is needed uh, to explain the universe, and so uh, that's where people who believe in a creator um, kind of uh, draw that from. Uh, how can we doubt that all this is affected not by merely by reason, but by reason that is transcendent and divine? Sounding almost biblical language, Cicero wrote, "You have uh, you see not the deity yet by the contemplation of his works, you are led to acknowledge a god." Right. 
And so even so an even those Roman, pagan yeah. <laughs> pagan Greeks yeah. uh, uh, see it, and and um, we'll we'll come up with uh, some more uh, evidences of of kind of uh, a predetermined belief in, in God in a little bit here too. And then finally, the the third type of evidence that uh, Nancy Piercy offers is from personhood. And speaking of evidence from creation, Paul does not mean only physical nature; he also means human nature. Mm. Human mm. beings are among the things that are made. Yeah. What do you know? Yeah, so we're part of it. Yeah, <laughs> part of the deal. Yeah. yeah. So how do uh, humans constitute evidence for God? Because they are personal agents. A personal being is a conscious agent with the capacity to think, feel, and act. In contrast to those uh, uh, that are unconscious. Uh, unconscious principle or substance that operate by blind automatic forces. And right. uh, point back to uh, uh, our, our interview with uh, Dr. Robert Murphy, where he talks about um, his, his idea of choice that, that, that humans have the ability to um, interact with the world, not uh, because it's a boulder rolling downhill, there's no choice in that boulder to roll down the hill, but there are um, specific uh, choice actions that we take that manipulate the world in some way. So, mm -hmm. uh, to, to plug in a great interview there. Not, mm -hmm. not by me, by, by him. So. <laughs> Uh, the existence of a personal being constitutes evidence that they were created by a personal God and not by a non-personal cause. And uh, here we point to William McCraig's uh, pretty, uh, always pretty decent explanation of the Kalam argument. Mm -hmm. It's one of those factors where uh, he seems to get probably a little bit more flack, but I think he does a really good job of saying, uh, okay, is there a personal God or a non-personal God? Or is, is, uh, is the universe personal or impersonal? And I think he, he draws a step down from, from there. So the Kalam argument has that kind of in the in the middle portion of the section yeah. there. He, he he suggests it's a kind of an implication from that argument. Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. <clears throat> uh, so the first cause that produced them must have a mind. The first cause must have a will, and so on, uh, because a human is a someone and not a something. The source of human life must also be a someone, yeah. and that's yeah. from philosopher Gilson. Uh, many Bible writers uh, use the same reasoning when they speak against idolatry. Uh, they imply that an idol is something, not a someone. And so uh, when you say uh, in Jeremiah, you know, say to the tree, you are my father, and to the stone you gave me birth. Well, uh, according to uh, evolutionary theory, you just say, thank you, stars, for birthing me, because I'm a product of generations upon generations of, <laughs> of, of non-living things becoming living things, and I got here by... Uh, sure accident and I owe nothing to nobody and that's that's it yeah but the, but the point she's trying to make is that the cause must be capable of producing the effect right right and so uh, so if you have a person as the effect then the cause for the person must be capable of producing mm -hmm. that effect and of right. course the cause then must be a person everything that begins to exist must have a cause yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah good. Uh, and then finally uh, uh, as she terms this section, atheists, children, and their God. So generation, uh, g general revelation falls under what's called uh, common grace, meaning that it's bestowed by God upon all people, regardless of their spiritual condition. In contrast to special grace, meaning the blessing of salvation. Um, and so uh, uh, all humans endeavor, and, and all human endeavors depend on God's common grace. So anything that we do, uh, there, there's there's kind of that idea that there are no such thing as atheists um, uh, because we're all uh, uh, children of God in the sense that we're all uh, made by him and dependent on him. Uh, the upshot is that humans are surrounded by evidence for God simply because we are made uh, in in the image of God as, mm. as probably the, the prime example. It's, it's kind of the first example given in scripture in mm -hmm. Genesis. Mm -hmm. uh, we live in God's universe and we're upheld by God's common grace. So uh, Romans eleven thirty six for from him and through him and to him are all things. Uh, this may explain why, and he, here's uh, the examples I was talking about. Uh, there are evidences in every culture that young children have a concept of God. Uh, when children are directly asked about the origin of animals and people, they tend to prefer an explanation that involves an intentional creator, mm. even if the adults who raise them do not, which is interesting. Uh, there are also scientific uh, evidence that show uh, that built into the natural development of children's minds is a predisposition to see the natural world as designed and purposeful, and that some kind of intelligent being is behind that purpose. Even if a group of children were put on an island and they were raised by themselves, this uh, scientist says, I think that they would believe in God. Mm. And it appears that we have been educated out of the knowledge of God uh, by uh, various uh, departments. And so um, it's, it seems like uh, the idea to, to, um, to believe in a God 
uh, is, is spoken about because uh, Romans 1 tells us that uh, th there's evidence pr pr clearly, clearly presented, and then it goes on to uh, why why we uh, why why we don't have just a bunch of believers going mm -hmm. around saying, mm -hmm. well, I believe in God, but I just don't want Him ruler of my life. <laughs> there are, there are people that even say uh, there is no God because of this. Yeah, so so good. So the first point that she's trying to make that comes out of Romans chapter one mm -hmm. verses nineteen and twenty is that we all have access to evidence. So we can't say that there is no evidence, right? We all have, and and not only that, we can't say that we don't have access to the evidence. She says that according to this, according to these verses. Uh, you know, what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. So we all have access uh, to evidence. There's the physical evidence of nature. There's the uh, evidence from life. There's the evidence from personhood. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's what she's trying to, that's the issue that she's right. trying to make here. So that's kind of her first point out of, um, out of uh, Romans uh, chapter 1. Her second point, as you mentioned, is, why then doesn't everybody, you know, believe? If mm -hmm. we all have access to evidence, that is, if these facts show that God exists, then why is it that everybody doesn't be yeah. uh, isn't a believer? They have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that are made. So they're clearly perceived, therefore they're evidence, and people go, oh, okay, well, I see God. Yeah, yeah. So why not? Yeah, right. So that's the question, right? And so the second uh issue that she wants to draw, uh, wants us to draw from Romans chapter 1 is the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't everybody believe? And she says it's, uh, it's, it's rather simple, right? Uh, Romans 1.18 says that they suppress the truth. Romans 1.21 says that although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. Romans uh, one twenty eight says they did not see fit to acknowledge God. So they're refusing to acknowledge God, even though there's evidence for it, right? They are refusing to honor God, even though there's evidence for him. Mm -hmm. And the idea here, the basic idea here is that suppression of truth is what's going on, right? And so her, her point here is that we all suppress the evidence for God from creation. We all suppress that truth, right? Mm -hmm. Um she says, uh, God has made everything known to us, and he wants to interact with us, and he has his own views about what, uh, you know, what our lives should be like. And, of course, uh, we don't want that, right? We don't want God in control of our lives and, and that sort of thing. And so what we do is we kind of uh, hold down the knowledge that, we, that comes out of creation, Right? and suppress it uh, because we don't want God in our lives in such a right. way as that. Think about uh, like taking a, a basketball into a pool and tr trying to keep it under the surface. It always wants to pop back out. Yeah. And sometimes you yeah. can have fun yeah. uh, you know, hitting your brother in the head with, with something uh, like a basketball in the pool. Uh, not saying I haven't done that. <laughs> um, but, uh, but that you a actively have to kind of keep it down, keep it under wraps, keep it under your feet, and then you know, all, all it takes is one good slip and... It pops back to the surface. So. Yeah, she, so, yeah. So she says, basically, she says, today we uh, casually use the pop psychology phrase, you're in denial, <laughs> right? right? To right. mean someone who is refusing to admit a problem or face an unpleasant fact. And so she says that folks that um, uh, don't acknowledge God are in denial like this, mm -hmm. right? Because God has made it evident and plain um, to everyone. Yeah, right? there are evidences that, that, they won't accept because things like their worldview uh, get in the way. And where do they get their worldview from uh, is definitely a, a longer conversation as yeah, well that yeah. uh, we'll get into in, in the later part of the book here. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, she says, um, but the problem is ignorance, as even our principles, our legal principles, suggest that ignorance of the law is is no excuse, right? You're still... Uh, you're still what we might call culpable or blamable yeah. for doing something wrong. You sh you ought to know, right? And so the same thing uh, 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 applies here. She says we have what she calls an epistemic duty to acknowledge what we know and confirm uh, our li and conform rather our lives to it. And by epistemic duty, you know, she's saying that we ought to know, right? Epistemology is the is the uh, uh, episteme is a Greek word for knowledge, and we have a duty because we ought to know these things because God has made it evident and plain. Yeah. So we can't say, you know, uh, we uh, we um, 
Uh, we don't know. We do know. We just suppress the truth. And we can't say, well, you know, as a result of suppressing the truth, then I'm okay. I'm not blameworthy. I am because we have a duty to know. Why right? ignorance of the truth in this case is no excuse, right? You're expected to to um, uh, to adhere to the truth that God has made known. She says that um, at the heart of the human condition, we might say, is an epistemological sin, right? A <laughs> sin with regard to knowledge or knowing, right? The refusal to acknowledge what we can, what can be known about God, and then to respond appropriately, right? Romans one twenty one says, although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. So they engage in what we might call, what she calls willful blindness they refuse to see right and so that's the problem so we have all of this evidence all of creation shows evidence for god right all of life shows evidence from god personhood in us shows evidence yeah. from god but we as sinful creatures uh, refuse to acknowledge the evidence we suppress the truth that nature attempts to give us, right, with regard to God. Mm -hmm. And so that is, that's part of the problem. That's why everybody isn't a believer, right. because people suppress the truth, mm -hmm. all right? Right. Uh, so how do they hide then? How, how, do we, how do we look at other human beings and say, oh, uh, they're, they're not uh, evidence for uh, a grand designer that, that uh, I can um, be of the same substance material as, uh, you know, someone halfway around the world and we had uh, no no common ancestors uh, uh, up until you know year three <laughs> of whenever that was. <laughs> how how come I can still interact with that person? How come I, I can still have uh, a, a sense of duty to that person? Uh, uh, how come there's uh, morality that we mm. both seem to have, um, uh, or, or even looking at our own mirror and and not having uh, what we talked about a little bit last time of this nihilistic approach that, uh, you know, nothing matters and there's there's no such thing as, as right and wrong. It seems like that has to come later, uh, especially with um, with uh, what we read uh, a little bit ago with as far as um, uh, kind of this uh, census divinitas being yeah. uh, being imbued into us yeah. um, uh, at an early age. So, so her next issue is then how she wants to, she suggests that the scriptures here in Romans chapter one describe how we hide, right? right? And so we might, uh, I know the time is, is getting uh, oh, uh, short here, so yeah. why don't we uh, uh, pause it for uh, this episode, and we'll pick up uh, and try to see how she answers this question of how we hide, right? We know that we do hide because everybody would be a believer, right? right. <laughs> so we do suppress the truth. How do we suppress the truth? And I think this will be a really key in terms of helping us to see at least the strategy strategy that she's going to show us later on. Mm -hmm. So we'll leave a link to the uh, book below. Uh, uh, hopefully you've had an uh, opportunity to get it, at least in the past. It's, it's, it's been on sale before for like a dollar. Uh, I think her other book is on Audible. Um, I don't think this one is. No, this is on Audible. Oh, this Audible. one's on Audible. Okay. Yeah, so uh, Audible it'd be, if, if you're not a, a reader, a listener, you can uh, pick it up that way. Um, and so those links will be in the description below. And uh, we'll see you next week.